so very much. It is wonderful to be back here, mere three months after the conference. Uh, today, uh, I'm talking about the story All You Zombies, written in 1959 by Robert Heinlein, and recently in two, uh, 2014 rebooted into the film Predestination, uh, starring Ethan Hawke and directed by the Spirit Brothers. And as an introduction to the work that I do, um, a question that comes up is why science fiction? Why is science fiction related to identity? Why is science fiction related to culture? And three particular examples that I focus on are the work of Timothy Mil uh, Meller, Colin Milburn, and Domna Pastor Mazzi. And um, Timothy Meller's work on the covert sphere looks at how covert operations affect culture and cultural development. In an introductory chapter, he talks about the process of brainwashing brainwashing as a sort of pseudoscience, as a sort of idea, was furthered by a CIA report where the founding doctor who brought together information based most of his analysis not on clinical cases, but on distant historical summaries and literature, particularly Huxley, Coastler, and Orwell. So these science fiction stories made it not just into general reports, but a CIA field book for how to practice and how to um, work against brainwashing as a covert operative. Um, the work of Colin Milburn looks at science and science fiction, how science fiction stories based on the particle the tachyon are used, have been used for years to further the field of science pursuing particle physics and light. And in Domna Pasturmazzi's work, um, she states that uh, science fiction will be a vocal presence in the cultural debates about the role of biomedical sciences and biotech in human life. It continues to reflect, shape, and subvert the very futures it embraces. And these works are very interesting for transhumanist and posthumanist theory, looking at changes to the body. Uh, Domna's work looking at science fiction focuses on how these stories have shaped what people determined to be ethical or moral choices for what is done to the physical body. And what I work in particularly is an idea of classic science fiction. And classic is a hard word to talk about because I'm talking about the hard white male science fiction, um, and it's very loaded terminology necessarily. And to kind of address this, I look at DeGraw's writing that, like the readers, the science fiction authors were heavily influenced by Anglo-centric patriarchal society in which they lived. Not only did they cater to the masculine ideals of their young male audience, but also the authors held similar ideas due to their shared culture. And it's something that's been recognized by Ursula K. Le Guin as something figurative of the 1940s to the 1960s and later iterations of science fiction, where you had very white, very male authors. And it's something that's hard to get into, but I find that it's necessary because these cultural artifacts are constantly being rebooted. These stories that were written by white men for a white young audience are being remade into films and TV shows. The Heinlein story is made into the film Predestination. The story of the man in the high castle is now a multi-Emmy winning Amazon series. And looking at these repetitions of culture, it becomes necessary because someone is going to make these stories into something else. And if we can get in before these stories and these films are made from older writing and disrupt this narrative, it's better. Um, what I look at is trying to break these marble white bones to try and find the narratives of people of color, of disabled individuals and trans individuals as they were consumed by these white authors and try to revitalize them and bring them back out to the surface and make it visible. And in the case of All You Zombies, the source text follows a single character, Time Travel. It initiates the story with the barkeep who is on a mission to recruit the unmarried mother, which is a younger version of the same character who is the transition version of Jane, who was very briefly John. And looking at it in the style of the story, it's hard to follow. So looking at it linearly, we start with the character as the baby Jane, who is a intersex individual born with two sets of working genitalia, raised as a woman in an orphanage. This character doesn't really relate as either male or female and has a dissonance with other students in the orphanage. 
until she graduates from the orphanage, moves on to try and become a member of the spacefaring organization in the story. And she falls in love one day with the one person that seems to understand Jane as a person. And this mysterious figure then vanishes, leaving Jane pregnant. The birth for Jane is traumatic on the body. The baby shortly after is snatched. And the doctor who performs the birth um, ultimately decides that because Jane's uterus is no longer functional, Jane has to follow this very specific narrative of male or female. Because it's possible that Jane can develop naturally as a man, the doctor makes the decision while Jane has no consent to remove all sexual characteristics that are not man to this doctor. Resulting in John, a character who lives in a hospital for um, 11 months, goes through three traumatic surgeries, hormones, and ultimately because of the scarring of these procedures, can't find work in manual labor, doesn't have a trade, ultimately buys a typewriter and becomes the unmarried mother, who writes confession stories about the emotional difficulties of being uh, what the character refers to as a broken woman. This broken womanhood forms the entire narrative of the unmarried mother. And what I'd like to talk about today is the addition in the film version of the Fizzle Bomber, which is a character that doesn't fit the original narrative of All You Zombies. In All You Zombies, the character recruits themselves sets up the time travel paradox, and the story ends with everyone reflecting on what it means to think of yourself as the only thinking person in the world. However, in Predestination, the additional character of the Fizzle Bomber is the time spent from the barkeep's life to the death, in which the barkeep ultimately kills the Fizzle Bomber, which is something I will address later. But this completion of the narrative is a very interesting point that I'm hoping to get to, where instead of letting this character who transitions in a 1959 science fiction story just continue with life, it's violently ended by the barkeep. And to bring all of this together, I'm looking at the phrase suturing. Suturing has seen a lot of use in academic papers lately for bringing ideas together. It's an abstract idea of taking two separate fields, two separate ideas, bringing them together. But it is very far removed from an embodiment of suturing. Suturing is a difficult process. Suturing involves great amounts of pain for those who are conscious for it. And tugging, it's a bloody situation. And I look at suturing as a way to try and re-embody disability studies and trans studies. Um, and I do this looking through Wilderson and Mitchell and Snyder. Mitchell and Snyder's narrative prosthesis looks at disability as a stock feature of characterization, of characterization and an opportunistic metaphorical device. It is a disembodied, unrelative idea as disability is often used in narrative. And I also draw from Frank Wilderson, who talks about it. It's well known that a metaphor comes into being through a violence that kills rather than merely exploits the object so a concept might live. I want to return to suturing as an idea that doesn't forget that it's working on bodies, is relative to bodies, and is incorporated to bodies. And so I want to try and bring suturing and disability theory back into the critical flesh, because the actual process of scarring looks at protein fibers that have gone from the basket weave as it is a normal spread of flesh, spread of ideas, in scarring, these ideas are aligned. They're brought together, they're sutured, and they're something that actually physically and ideologically overlaps. And I do this as a way to kind of navigate the compulsory normative body, which is a development on McCrewer's compulsory able-bodiedness. In McCrewer's compulsory able-bodiedness, we look at a society that assumes in advance that we all agree able-bodied identities, perspectives, and perspectives are preferable to and what we are collectively aiming for. And McClure does also have the caveat that looking at this compulsory able body doesn't deny the materiality of a queer or disabled body. It argues that critical queerness and severe disability are about collectively transforming. 
And so what I want to do is I want to look at this compulsory able-bodiedness as compulsory normative bodies, where bodies not just as far as queer or disabled, but also trans bodies are considered and brought together in these communities of scarring where it's possible to have conversations that overlap around the actual physical presence of scarring. Bodies that have changed either to reject or to more completely fit into this compulsory normative body. And this is something that comes up in the film version, not so much the story, of All You Zombies and Predestination. In All You Zombies, the character accepts this idea of becoming a man as of course this is what happens. Because I have this opportunity for genitals, I become a biological man, I live a biological life. In the film, the character is far more skeptical about what it means to have been changed, to have been forced into this alternate form of existence. And in a conversation between the barkeep and the unmarried mother, the barkeep makes a brief quip about, well, you seem like a normal man. And the unmarried mother laughs, a brief scoff, while the two of them are sitting at a table and says, I'm more normal than ever now. I found out that I'm not shooting blanks. And this could be a cursory nod to the necessary fertility for the storyline to continue. However, the character's treatment of this understanding of being biologically a man is tied to normality. This idea of, well, of course, because now I have the embodiment of fertility as a man, that makes me the most normal which is fortunate for us as well because the unmarried mother is constantly pushing against these ideas of having to live as a man, instead looking at alternate employment and alternate ways of living. Now on the screen we have an image from the, fi uh, from the film. This is the barkeep after a moment of revelation where the barkeep has demonstrated to the unmarried mother that the unmarried mother fell in love with themselves as Jane. And the character is sitting on a park bench wearing light clothes. Um, the barkeep's head is tilted slightly at an angle with his mouth, or with the mouth open slightly and large eyes looking to make this connection. And the character throughout the story is yearning to make a connection through these scars, constantly moving backward from the barkeep. And as the barkeep has said this to the unmarried mother, the barkeep then says, you know who she is, and you understand who you are, and now maybe you're ready to understand who I am. All while looking at the unmarried mother who is pointing a gun at the barkeep, trying to make this connection, thinking through the bodily changes that they have gone through to get there, the suffering that has had to happen to become the barkeep and fulfill this predestination paradox. And the scars in predestination work as a way to connect between a character who, in their own temporal time, does not feel a connection to themselves, does not feel a connection to others, and feels an isolation. Moving through time and moving through scars allow these, allows these characters to make a connection that they didn't have, only looking backwards. And this comes up frequently in conversation in the film. Uh, in the initial wooing period where the unmarried mother goes back to woo Jane, they're having a coffee date, and the unmarried mother looks at Jane and says, you pretend like love doesn't matter to you, when the truth is, it's all you ever think about. It's something the character as Jane didn't believe was possible. Jane was fixated on the mission of becoming a space traveling person rather than connecting with any of the other people in the crew, any of the other folks at the institution where Jane was training. Now this is where the fizzle bomber comes in to break this narrative of yearning over scars. And it makes for a complicated ending to the film. Because when the barkeep is faced with the fizzle bomber who has been taking hundreds and thousands of innocent people's lives for no apparent reason to the barkeep, the barkeep realizes that the fizzle bomber is the final iteration of the self. And the fizzle bomber says, if you shoot me, you become me. That's how it happens. If you want to break the chain, you have to not kill me, but try to love me again. Which happens right before the barkeep shoots the fizzle bomber. And there are multiple ways the end of the story can be read. The first and apparent one is a return to the idea of narrative prosthesis where this disabled character in the form of the fizzle bomber who has
mental differences from losing brain cells over time jumps and who for some inexplicable reason only uses one arm has to be removed from the narrative, causes fear in the barkeep and the barkeep shoots. But a more generous reading of this is looking at the way the different selves have interacted across the storyline. When the unmarried mother in com er, returns to Jane, the unmarried mother understands the pain that Jane has gone through, makes this connection, knows what's coming and replies with empathy. When the barkeep goes back in time to recruit the unmarried mother, there are frequent discussions with the head of the temporal organization about the discomfort of causing this pain, about the discomfort of making this scarring happen and its inevitability. But when the fizzle bomber encounters the barkeep, the only explanation is that the future can be changed and that the fizzle bomber is killing innocent people in order to save more potential future lives. And this potentiality across scarring is what gives the end of the movie hope. Because at the end of the film, the barkeep addressing a younger version of Jane says, can we change our futures? I don't know. But the hope is that returning through this conversation, the barkeep can make the option to respond with empathy and trying to seek a connection. Where the fizzle bomber used time travel to cause wounds, to cause harm, and to cause pain, following this repeating narrative, this repeating violence as an inevitability, if the barkeep has finally shut down the fizzle bomber and doesn't return to this path, we have a broken paradox. It's a theme in the story that a paradox can be paradoctored in the written story, which is something denied by the fizzle bomber in the film which is an interesting overlap of the two ideas, which I feel breaks this idea of narrative. And looking at these scars that the character uses to connect to other iterations of self, I draw on the work of uh, Jessica Stokes, which is forthcoming in the Journal of Postgraduate American Studies, where Stokes looks at the connection of scarring in the freak show version of the American Horror Story television series. And in this conversation, Stokes notes that scars exist as sites of trauma and healing simultaneously. And while performance studies may attempt to limit performance to the act, the scar has no such limits. And acts of trauma and separation that the freak show performers have experienced mark them with these scars, ephemera of trauma that also forms a part of a healing community. In this analysis of American Horror Stories Freak Show, Stokes looks at the freak show performers who carry scars, are scarred either physically, emotionally, or internally. Um, Stokes looks at the scarring of the liver, the scarring of the other characters as ways to explore both the time where wounding occurred on the body, the time where these scars brought people together in community, and ultimately the scars that form this space where individuals can create their own community that's supportive emotionally, supportive physically. Um, in the uh, paper, Stokes looks at one character who was forcibly scarred by their father, who insisted that if their daughter was going to hang out with this group of people, they had to become a freak, and splits the tongue, puts on tattoos, and through this traumatic act, the entire freak show community comes together to find revenge on this father, to make a restorative act for the daughter by coming together around her and really bringing her into the community in ways that hadn't happened before. And the scar is a place where these aspects of identity can communicate and form community without being flattened into a single perspective. And herein I find a real, true potentiality for scars. Because the scar is a spot that doesn't stick to a single time, stick to a single place, and stick to a single field, it works to really bring multiple ideas together, multiple communities together, where scars can be central to understanding. And part of this transition between the social idea of scarring and the physical fact of scarring is to return to the origin of stigma. Stigma um, comes from the term that was used to put marks on slaves and Greek outcasts and prisoners that separated them from the rest of community. 
the stigma that was placed upon the body brought the individual out of community. And by looking at a way to bring these scars back, in, back together with other communities, we find a way that we can physically unite around stigma, these scars that are both social and physical. And um, true support for that I find um, with the author Kai Green looking at trans as a value or an optic that, similar to queer, refuses temporal or spatial fixity. Like the scarring, trans offers this communication that's focused on the non-normative, the change, the transition, and the freedom of movement of ideas and bodies. And at this level of making a trans optic, Green makes the argument that it's necessary to feel pain and loss because it opens up a space to something new. And that's true of the space of scar. The scar opens up an avenue to talk about medical communities, to talk about emotional communities and physical communities, where people can come together at these points of connection and form a connective tissue of ideas. Um, the top of the slide says suturing critical race, disability, and trans theory. And a large amount of my work relies on the um, use of critical race theory and disability theory. And in the work, The Erotics of Racism, Holland talks about the process where um, the goal here is to get comfortable with a loss, in this case talking about racism, not replacing representation and by not making the obvious critical move to recover black female queer with an appropriate sign of her belonging. And that is central to my argument for this idea of classic science fiction. It's not possible to go back to the violence of science fiction as it was written in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s and undo it at that time. But because we have this malleable time, this transition of time where articles are being reworked, remade, and redone, we have a chance to get in and rework this, not necessarily by inserting random figures of representation, but by critically reworking the narrative to create a potential future where it belongs. And as you can see, the slides get larger and larger and larger as I keep going on and trying to get in ideas. But this idea of the uh, trans and disabled community coming together has been touched on in other fields by um, the scholar uh, Dean Spade, who does law work with um, trans and disability, and has noted in um, their work that they come across these situations where patients' massive scars are the result of a surgeon's unconscious sadism in which to scar the patient for going against nature. And these scars for individuals who have transitioned, this is a, a particular case where it's a public residential hospital where it was authorized, talks about how having these operations outside of communities where there's a conscious effort towards refusing the non-normative body, where there's a conscious effort, a societal pressure to force bodies into a normative narrative is disrupted by the violence of scars. The scarring itself becomes an act where the societal pressure pushes against the identity formation of self causing the scarring. And on the scene we have a, um, a image that was um, presented by Rosemary Garland Thompson looking at the already existing connections between disability and feminist theory with the Obsessed with Breasts campaign, which was a popular culture campaign looking at um, the obsession with a sexualized female body. And pushing against this representation, we have the image of a person who has undergone a mastectomy with a single scar and a breast obstructed by one arm in the style of a Calvin Klein's, um, I believe it was an obsession, was the perfume smell. And these posters produce a powerful visual violation by exchanging the spectacle of an eroticized breast, which has been desensationalized by its endless circulation with the medical, uh, 
medicalized image of the scar breast, which has been concealed from public view. And this is a situation where the suturing of feminist theory and disability theory was very successful on a cultural level. It brought attention to women's health issues as well as living in the aftermath of a mastectomy. It brings the public and the private, which had supposedly been separate, to focus on only a normative body in public and other bodies kept private and locked away as a way to reverse this imagery and bring it out into a cultural exchange. And then, um, to bring in some scientific understanding, um, there has been work looking at trans communities and disabled communities for the benefits of friendships and non-normative interaction. And what I found through these different health journals was that individuals were significantly more likely to report feeling comfortable when first identifying as trans, less likely to report feeling suicidal, and more likely to feel comfortable with other trans people when they had interacted with people who had already transitioned or were in the process of transitioning. These articles found that people had a more positive impact towards their own self-identity when they had been part of a community that had undergone similar situations. And particip uh, in another article, participants related benefits of transgender and sexual minority friendships to common understandings, shared experiences, or knowledge in ways that made non-normative experience primary. And this community of scarring that looks and focuses on the non-normative body, breaking away from this compulsive normativity for physical embodiment, was beneficial to those uh, folks in the groups that had already had these conversations. And finally, the disability rights movement and the legal claims developed by the tireless activism of people in that movement is about pointing out that disabled people are capable of equal participation, but are currently barred from participating equally by artificial conditions that privilege one type of body or mind and exclude others. And this is from Dean Spade's work looking at the legal intersection of disability law and um, laws in the regulation of trans people where the American with Disabilities Act specifically bars um, transitioning surgeries and protection as being a disability, whereas um, Spade and others have been able to find advances working with the disability community at the state level where there are certain permissions for state disability uh, coverage. And then there are three extensive pages of work cited for anyone who would like to go through and find these same sources and conversations. And with that, I'm looking at an idea of the non-normative body becoming a primary site for conversation around communities of scarring, where the scar is a critical physical element to the conversation because it brings things physically together. It unites at the space where both social, cultural, and physical interact to become one potentiality. Thank you very much.